Hello, everybody. This is Constance from Mysterious Galaxy. I am so happy that you are joining us this afternoon or evening, depending on your time zone and where you are. It is my pleasure to introduce to you. We have Levita Tadar and then also Sylvia Morena Garcia. And we are here to celebrate by force alone Levi's new book. And then mm -hmm. Sylvia out as well, Mexican Gothic. I am gonna go ahead and let them take it away. Um, they're gonna tell you a bit more about themselves and their works. You guys are in phenomenal hands. And also just remember, if you have questions, there is a beautiful button down below that says ask a question. So make sure to ask your questions there. And then also, if you would like to purchase these amazing books, we have the awesome ability to get to give you guys signed book plates, which is amazing because Lavi is not even in our country. So super, super special. I will let you guys go ahead and take it away though and have an amazing event. Hi there. <laughs> All right. Do we, do we even have an audience or do we just talk to each other in, in an empty room? <laughs> I, I think we do have an audience. I, I haven't seen you in quite a while. <laughs> you look, I know. Are, you, are you turning into a lobster yet? I, but basically I only have to look at water to get, you know, like a massive ear infection. I'm never going to be a fish, but so it's more a case of just looking longingly at, at the sea. Um, yeah, so I'm using my one good ear at the moment. Um, Wonderful. Yeah, did you want to introduce yourself? Should I introduce you? Why don't you introduce yourself? You you have so many awards, well, I cannot remember how many nominations you've had. Well, I'm Sylvia Moreno Garcia. Um, <laughs> I wrote Mexican Gothic. <laughs> kind of wish I wrote Mexican Gothic. I mean, my thing at the moment is I'm trying desperately to think how do I capitalize on Mexican Gothic? What do I do? What do I do to to get some of that glory? Um, <laughs> I'm failing miserably. So um, no, I am Levi Didar. Um I wrote a book called By Force Alone, which is out now. Although I won't actually get to see a copy for a while, I think. So I've just seen pictures of it, and it looks nice. Um, yeah. I assume, like, if you tuned in randomly to this, you must be very confused. But otherwise, I kind of assume people vaguely know that we've written books and things, and, and we also write the um, the science fiction and fantasy book column for the Washington Post, which yes, which is very cool. It's very yes, cool. That's right. And I noticed the last one we did is really popular. The, the fantasy noir of all things. Who knew people like fantasy noir? Finally, they like us. <laughs> so yeah, I. I but they don't I, like us. They just want to correct us on a lot of things. Usually. I know. Eight hundred words. Why didn't you include every single author who ever wrote um, fantasy noir? <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's, I mean, I was going to say like there's like oh, and and one person really didn't like the introduction. I oh. think so. There's always. That was so cute. And one though. person. <laughs> One person hunted us on Twitter to say I couldn't leave a comment on the website, so here is my correction <laughs> to your article. Well, they hunted you. They didn't hunt me. Or, or, I, or yeah, I don't know. I, I've got my settings very muted, so I see very few people from the outside world. So Right. Yeah. That's sensible. <laughs> That's sensible. Um, okay. Well, what do we have? What should we talk about? Do we have? I, I, do you want well, to introduce I, yourself as the mega successful author of Mexican I, Gothic? I am the author of Mexican Gothic, uh, which people are reading, and Untamed Shore, which came out this year, but also nobody read, <laughs> which is a noir, and a bunch of other things that also nobody <laughs> read because this is the first time I've gotten a royalty check. So, hooray for me! <laughs> Yeah, that's what I wanted to ask you is what does it feel like to be successful? <laughs> that's... It, it was very good right now because with the pandemic, um, well, my husband is laid off because he, you know, worked in the in the hotel industry. So I was very worried for, for a while back, um, you know, after coming back from the States from this book thing that I was doing. First of all, I was afraid I was going to die because I had to go into quarantine in the attic. And, and then, 
<laughs> and then I was sick around that time too. And then I, I was afraid I was going to double die because if I had to go to the hospital, you know, I was going to get COVID. And so I was hiding in the attic, trying not to die of something else <laughs> and then also get COVID. And then he got laid off. So that was like um, an, an interesting thing. And then, and then it's just kind of ominous. I work in a university and we don't know how many students are coming back until September. So we're expecting, expecting a deficit. We don't know how big it is. So you're always thinking like, oh, is this my last year working there? Uh, that kind of stuff. So this came out at a really good time because I was not sleeping some <laughs> nights, right? You know, just awake, like how many money, how much money do we have in the savings account? So it was good that I actually have a royalty check now paid off my debts immediately and I'm not looking at um, some kind of uh, horrible Dickensian kind of poverty situation. <laughs> which is which is always a very romantic ideal until you have responsibilities and also you get used to like eating occasionally. <laughs> yes, yes. And and I, I did have one thing where I've always kind of hidden certain food items and I, and I hid rice around the house like under the bed like as a as like a coping mechanism and i told that to a friend um years ago and then she actually messaged me recently and she said you were right about the rice bags i thought it was nuts but you were not wrong like keep a, a bag of rice hidden somewhere in your home <laughs> during covid she was like oh my god <laughs> so See, to me yeah. you should have been you should have been hp lovecraft you should have basically died from eating beans from a can fired that's what I'm terrified of. It it really is one of my worst fears is to end up like H. P. Lovecraft, who was in this tiny kind of like attic. I don't know if you've ever seen where he lived. I have. Is this tiny little room at the top of this New England house, and he was like eating cans of beans, and that's at all he was having. And then he's writing in his letters about like people think it's a really bad diet to eat expired cans of beans, <laughs> but if you add a little bit of salt, it's actually quite nice. And you're like, oh my god, like. Like, it's horrible. But he liked ice cream. He did like ice cream, though. You know, it's, just, like, it's the sort of story that's never going like to end. <laughs> he liked the curry. That's one of the weird things about him. He really liked curry and chili. Chili con mm. carne. Yeah, I know. Yeah, what, it, what happens with Lovecraft is he hates everyone, and then he tries the food, and he suddenly hates them a little bit less. You know, like he discovered Italian food, and he still hates Italians, but he suddenly. He likes Italian food. And then at some point, I think he had some people from Iceland moved into his you know, <laughs> grandmother's property and he suddenly hated Icelandic people. And so how can you hate Icelandic people? They're like the purest form <laughs> of iron that you could sort of, you know, that you worship. But he hated everyone. Um, so you're saying if we had taken Lovecraft to dim sum, we might have solved some of his psychological issues. <laughs> Well, well, he was married to a Jewish woman. He still hated Jews. <laughs> I know, I know. That was I an interesting know. marriage. It'd probably be, but yeah. that dim sum is nice. Yeah. But, yeah. 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 Well, that, what people don't, what people don't realize, the last time we saw each other, we went on a tour of Lovecraft Country. Yes. Um, very briefly. Um, not, not a place anyone Jewish would feel particularly comfortable to this day. I think. Um, I don't know how you do, but uh, when we were talking about the pandemic, what happened was that you were actually you flew off to the states to do a book tour, and I yeah. think you actually made it as far as Mysterious Galaxy. I did, right, I did. <laughs> and then kind of ran off just before they shut down everything and had to quarantine. Yes. And yeah, at the same I, time, I was supposed to be doing the London Book Fair and then Dublin Comic Con and then go to the States in June um, yeah. to do Mysterious Galaxy and so on. And so we were kind of watching it. You were still out there and my, my stuff just got cancelled and cancelled and cancelled um, as we were watching it, really. So you kind of got a sense that things are not going well. <laughs> a sense of cosmic horror. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I changed my uh, my return ticket um, two days before they closed the border, I think. Um, and uh, I did it because I was very getting very nervous and angsty. Um, 
And yeah, it was when I got on the flight, every Canadian who was on that flight, we were all just basically yelling, take off, take off, for God's sake. You know? <laughs> like a guy next to me from Alberta just clutched me to his seat, like, we got to get out of here. Um, yeah, it was, it was kind of interesting. Yeah, I mean, very I zombie I, apocalypse <laughs> i think i complained about it a little bit on twitter because i spent all of last summer like an idiot writing another children's book um That's right. and the working title was quarantine <laughs> <laughs> and, it's, and it's it went out on submission two weeks before quarantine came down worldwide and <laughs> this book is ne not getting published not <laughs> anytime and I thought so this summer I just thought you know what I'm not going to write anything I, it was you know, I spent the whole summer writing a children's book um, yeah so I'm staying away from quarantines and, and in fact staying away from writing for the moment yeah well I, I also thought my career was over because <laughs> you know like I, I was like and with all this happening I was just telling my husband like well uh, it was good while it lasted. So yeah, Mexican yeah. Gothic. Thank God, who knew that was uh, that was what people wanted to read. So um, so smart on me. I did tell them it will sell. They didn't quite believe me. You know, like yeah, sure, Sylvia. But yeah, I think it's sold. Um, it, but you, it's yeah. a great title. It's a great title. That's yeah, it, it it was a working title. But you've done um, so. You've done everything. Yeah, like now. You've got a comic book, Adler. Uh, you got children's book, maybe not the quarantine <laughs> children's no, not that book, one. but another children's book, which is actually, you know, uh, has it come out of the States or is it coming out now? It's coming out in three weeks. In three weeks, okay. And what, what's it called in the States? It's called Candy or is it called the Mafia? The it's called the candy mafia in america the candy mafia. okay yeah, yeah the candy mafia it's yeah. a fun book and it's a detective book so you should all check it out yeah check it out um, for your kids and and you've also got now the beginning of a kind of british fantasy trilogy so those are really quite quite different things <laughs> are they i mean are they, are they really i mean how did you get yeah. into comic books for example I, I don't know how you write a comic book I didn't know how to write a comic book either. Um, to be honest, I got I got into writing comics because I contributed to this small press magazine in the UK that did comics as well as fiction. And the guy said to me, "If you want to do some comics, I'll you know I'll hook you up with an artist and and you can do one." So I kind of had to learn how to write them, and I had no idea how to write comics. I did. I mean, I didn't even do scripts. I. It was ridiculous the way I wrote them to begin with. I did like squares and then I wrote inside the squares and, and the artist got very confused and I had no idea what I was doing. But I gradually kind of figured it out a little bit and then the opportunity came about to do this comic uh, with a guy called Paul McCaffrey. And the funny thing is, it was announced back in 2013 in san diego comic con so it's been seven years in the works not because i write slow but because paul just spent like a month doing a page you know it looks amazing but it's been seven years of me patiently waiting and as soon as we were ready to go a global pandemic happened so it's kind of god you know we released two issues and the third one is coming out this week so i think on tuesday so I have a lot of things coming out that no one is reading. It's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> it's exciting. Uh, but what about uh, what about uh, by force alone? I mean, this is really the beginning of your British tr trilogy. So you got King Arthur in this one, and then we've got Ivanhoe, and then we've got um, Shakespeare, if if I'm not mistaken, right? <laughs> I, mean, I see what you're saying. Either. No, firstly, I mean, who's going to do a trilogy in this day and age? It has to be at least a, um, a, a quartet. Although now I'm <laughs> beginning to think, you know, maybe it should be a bit more. No, the whole thing was I wrote this King Arthur book completely randomly. I mean, I kind of worked on it quietly. I don't, I don't even know because I, I mean, I hate Arthurian fiction and I hate British fantasy. Oh, well, can you? Yeah, tell me about your love about T. H. White. 
<laughs> well, at some point, I actually had to teach. Um, um, I got dragged by my old university into teaching an undergraduate class on British fantasy fiction. Um, so I've, suddenly, I'm standing in a room in front of a lot of 18 year old American students trying to talk about, you know, this stuff. And the guy who set it up um, is a medievalist. So he was like the green, what is it? Gawain and the Green Knight. Let's study that in the original Old English. Um, and let's talk about the color scheme in the poem in Old English. And so I had absolutely no idea what he was talking about. I didn't know what any of that stuff meant. And I ended up writing a book about it, um, just as a way of figuring it out. So, so once I did that, the, the publishers kind of said, well, what are you working on next, you know? And I was like, well, you know, I mean, theoretically, you could say it makes sense to do Robin Hood next. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're going to do Robin Hood, then you might as well keep going and do the other, all the other British sort of myths. So, so it might actually happen. I mean, I finished this big Robin Hood book, which is ridiculous. It's basically... You know, I borrowed this character called Rebecca from Ivanhoe, who's a who's a Jewish Jewish girl in Nottingham. And I'm like, why why are there Jews in Nottingham? What are there Jews doing in Nottingham in in you know the medieval period? And they're there, they're actually there. Um so I borrowed her and then a lot of fungus just got into it. And the whole thing became a very fungally Jewish fungus gothic noir thing like, I, I completely had no control over it i was like i don't know why this book is happening the way it is but i'll go along with it and somehow it comes together in the end so so yeah i'm thinking about shakespeare <laughs> well, of course um <laughs> yes what's uh i, I think we have like a question that. as well so what are you working on next because it's it's a crime novel next isn't it or have you finished a new crime novel uh, the next one that will come out will be a crime novel, yes, um, Dangerous Eagerness, but it's already finished. So okay. it, we're doing, I'm getting the editorial letter sometimes this month and doing edits uh, during the fall. But yeah, it's already done. Uh, what am I working on right now? The thing is, I work really fast, so it's it's hard to say. Um, like uh, the, the daughter of Dr. Moreau is technically um, uh, the thing that I am... Uh, that I am supposed to be working on, but I actually have a good enough draft that right now I am researching for something else. So I stopped that and uh, and I've moved on to research. And that, that's why we were talking about Nazis the other day, you and I, and, and that's where <laughs> that one came from, right? As we do, like Nazis, like our, Nazis are like really common in our conversations <laughs> in one way or another, but it, it was that one. It, it was, uh, um, it was because um, I, I found a footnote in a in a book about um, occultism, and that read, led me into a rabbit hole. So I'm now uh, reading a lot about different secret societies, and also reading about uh, yeah Nazis on the side. So that's so that's been uh, kind of interesting. But I should be working technically on the daughter of Dr. Moreau. I just kind of like stopped it because I thought I had enough stuff done that I could that I could do something else. And, and I'm also a workaholic, just like you. So I was supposed to take like a couple of weeks off because Moreau was in such good shape that I could afford to just, you know, watch TV and whatever. And I normally don't watch TV at all, no TV shows. Uh, but I got on Netflix and I said, okay, well, I'll watch some television like normal people do instead of being some bizarre ghoul who never watches any kind of visual media. And um, and I found something called uh, oh they they had like um, unsolved mysteries some on uh, Netflix the new unsolved mysteries so I watched those and then it recommended me things like um, murderous couples uh, people who kill dogs who <laughs> who kill their pets with a grudge stuff like that and I watched over a period of like because I had you know like nothing much to do after you know my day job like in the evenings I was just logging in and I watched like I watched so many episodes of forensic files that I can now determine blood splatter and 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 I thought <laughs> after a while of that after like a week of that or 10 days of that this month I was like I have to stop it's 
it's too much. It's just like murder, murder, murder. And, and I'm doing it just to fill my hours, right? Not because I really wanted to, but I mean, I do like mm. murder, murder crime stuff, but it was just because I felt I had to be resting. Like I couldn't be working. And then, so I said, this is not working. It's stressing me out even more to be relaxing that you're mm. actually doing work. So now I'm back and doing research and, and working. And it's a lot better because uh, even though it sounds weird, it's better mentally, I think, to be reading about Nazis and occultism than to actually be watching, you know, 10 hours of like forensic files and people telling you how the bullet went into the body and showing you pictures of dead people. Um, it was just too much, but I felt like, well, I have to relax. So uh, I have to lay on the couch and not think. And obviously I can't do that. So now we're back to my regular research kind of personality, which is just read a lot of books and uh, take notes. <laughs> yeah, I think most writers I know just get really irate with if they're not working for a while, for even a few days. I mean, I know I do. Um, I think this is the first time I'm not writing and I can't and I'm bored. <laughs> so bored. I want to go back and get back to work I mean you know I was really into the whole I had like a couple of novellas I was gonna write I was doing short stories and I was gonna start the next big the next big fantasy book so, sort of thing um no it's terrible it's terrible uh, you have to be working it's a it's a curse but it's, it's almost I always think of it as like sort of an addiction that you start you start getting a bit like ah, you know i need i need to be writing again so yeah yeah but well, I mean, uh, we, have, we do have a question that i mean i think people do want to hear so let's get it out of the way how is your mexican gothic tv series going i mean <laughs> rub, rub some rub some salt into these things well it's too early it's too early to tell i mean most people um they're asking me about casting, right? Um, but the first thing you do with a TV show is you find the writer or writers. In, in, in this in this case, it's a limited TV um, series, so it's eight eight episodes, something like that. But so first, uh, what they're going to be doing is finding the screenwriters, and then the director, and then the production people, and then way down the line, you get to you get to casting. So right now. Um, it's really early days, so there's really nothing much to tell except that they are like gathering a massive amount of names of, of script of script writers that could be that would could be working on it. And and we did talk about diversity and um, the importance of getting some actual Latino writers on there. So it's going to be uh, people who have an understanding of Mexico, who like can find it on a map, you know, All right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and 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 like that, and that is going to uh, also be the case with uh, some of the other production people who are going to be working on the show. We I we talked about finding people who have that kind of cultural background, so that again, you don't have something where you you've got people wondering what is that reboso, you know, which is just a piece of clothing. But you know, when you have people who are so clueless, then bad things can happen. So. And, and the cast is going to be obviously um, a mixed cast because I have characters who are British and very blonde, <laughs> and then I have the Mexican the Mexican people. So yeah, it's going to be it's going to be interesting. But we're not we're not close to that. Uh, it's just it's the boring part where you get to think about screenwriters, <laughs> not the exciting part where you actually get to cast anybody. Um, but you see, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think your experience is quite. It's not that unusual. I mean, there are people who've kind of had the, the big TV film deals, but I think that the usual experience is more likely, you know, you sign an option, they take you out for lunch once, you know, once a year, um, and not much happens. I think that's what people don't necessarily know, that books and comics get optioned all the time. Yeah. And for most of us, it's just, it's slowly ticking along and, and you know, it, it's kind of like hitting the lottery um, to get anything made. And then what's funny is you see someone who, who got the TV series made and then kind of starts complaining about the TV series. And it's like, just take your money, man. Just take your money. Yeah. <laughs> There's no sympathy no, we, here, you know. We did just option something else. And that, but that is with a very small company. 
uh, for a very small amount of money. And so you haven't heard any deal announcement because of that. And, and it's going to go through the steps that you said. It's an option that will probably run through its time and, uh, and eventually just uh, disappear because that's, that's normal. And, and I have had several deals that didn't go through, right? Where we talked about um, options or shopping agreements, which are even worse than options because shopping agreement is when they give you $0 for your, for your, for the chance to make something, right? Um, so I had shopping agreements and uh, conversations about options and they always came to nothing, right? So we had, we never had any results. So this, this was unusual, a very unusual situation because we had several bidding parties wanting it. And that's not normally the case. And normally, and, and it doesn't even mean, even though they won the bid, that this will be made into a show in the end. Like I said, they are going to be looking for screenwriters. I do think this has a chance, a high chance of being made because Hulu is actually behind it. It's one of the parties that came into this deal, three part type deal. Um, but again, it could not, it could very well run out the option. And, you know, four years from now, there might be nothing. So that's why it's really early to be thinking about, uh, about casting or anything like that. Basically, if the check clears, we're good. <laughs> and if there's ever something done on it, yeah, it's like that would be that would be really great. But um, but yeah, for the most part, writers just live off. Uh, but options are good money, right? I mean, you don't do anything and you get you get a bit no, of money. It's free, it's free it. money. Yeah. yeah. So I can't I can't complain if if it doesn't become anything, then it just it wasn't meant to be. Um, but no, I wouldn't complain about a show or a movie that anybody made. Because I feel it's a different thing. It's a different product. Um, unless it was something like they got Tom Cruise and they put him in a wig and a Mexican hat, then I might say, <laughs> like, guys, we talked about this early on. <laughs> but um, but otherwise, uh, film and TV are just uh, so different from books. And you see something like Blade Runner, which is an excellent movie, but Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep is a completely different book. Um, completely different book. Just just adapted in a in a certain way, um, but it's but not a bad loved, product. <laughs> no, I love the book because I love the bit in the book when he shows up at a police station and he turns out to be an android police station. It just yeah, comes with you. It, it has all these little cool details, um, and I even like the sequel that they made, uh, Blade Runner twenty forty nine or whatever. Um, mm. which is an extension of the idea of the movie, not actually of the book. But, but yeah, so in, in that sense, it's like, well, you know, uh, sometimes it's okay if something deviates completely from the, um, from the original product. Um, in this case, I guess I would like it if, if it wasn't set in Iceland <laughs> with an all Icelandic cast. But on the other, you know, but on the other hand, it's a, uh, uh, yeah, if it turns out to well, be different, well, you know, we've, it'll be we've, different. <laughs> we've had years of um, Nordic noir, so maybe it's time to, to shift away. Um, <laughs> especially, if, have, you know, all the Nordic noir I've read is basically serial killers and Nazis. Like, everyone's a Nazi and everyone's a serial killer. As, as I know. They can make out. I am so pissed off about that because, like, Nazis are so really old right now and you're still... <laughs> seeing these uh, these books were like and he secretly was a nazi and i'm like come on can he be something else he's 120 years old <laughs> i couldn't resist and I, I like i was told to stay away from nazis after kind of overdoing the <laughs> nazi thing you know i mean when i was writing a man lies dreaming i had you know hitler staring at me on my work desk like constantly and when i finished the book i just had to get rid of these these biographies, and I, I knew far too much about him to ever be comfortable again. You know, I mean, I could talk, you know, people would talk to you if you go to a party and people would talk to you and say, well, did you know about Adolf Hitler's sex life? Um, and it's not really a conversation, you know, it's not a good icebreaker. Um, so I kind of, I kind of stopped with the Nazis for a bit. And then in By Force Alone, I couldn't resist. I couldn't resist just a tiny bit, even though it's set in medieval or whenever, no, the dark ages. But I had to have like a Nazi vampire. <laughs> like, just, 
just a tiny bit. I have to have a swastika in there just to kind of make it, you know, make it mine. <laughs> but yeah, stay stay away from. Although you can't really stay away from the Nazis if you're doing Doctor Moreau because they're kind of all over South America at that point. <laughs> it is true after a certain time period. Um, I think let's look at the questions. Let's see if anybody has something else. Oh, somebody's asking, Labi, how do you approach modernizing something as prevalent as Arthurian legend? Was there a detail or insight that you caught on that was a starting point? Well, I don't know if I was going for modernizing. I mean, what happened was I, I literally did have to engage with Arthurian myth in a, in, a, in a serious sort of way, just because I had to actually teach it. You know, I had to make sense of it to, to, to kids who don't know much about it. And I didn't know much about it. Like, I think I watched... I think there was like a manga, no, there was an anime series in the 80s or something. And you know, the usual, you know, the usual stuff. Arthur, the sword in the stone, Merlin, et cetera, et cetera, Lady in the Lake, um, Mallory. And, and so when I started reading about it, um, there were two things I kind of realized about the, the story that I didn't understand is firstly, the whole thing was not just made up, but it was made up by a whole bunch of different people. Um, and ironically, most of them were in British. You know, because it's the great British myth, and to this day, you have right-wing nationalist groups using stuff like um, Uther Pendragon as a symbol. You know, so the Pendragon and the flag and, and Arthur are are very much used in a nationalistic way, and we're always used in a nationalistic way. Um, basically, got revived in the 19th century to support this whole myth of the British Empire. Um, so it's always had this political nationalist agenda behind it. But it was all made up of Germans and French. You know, it wasn't, there's hardly any British people who contributed to it. Um, and the other thing I realized about it was that everyone is saying it's about chivalry, but there's actually no chivalry in the actual stories that you're reading. I mean, um, Uther Pendragon literally rapes Igraine with the help of Merlin. Merlin basically helps him change his face with magic so he could look like Igraine's husband. And then he goes, and, that, and that's how Arthur is born. You know, I didn't make this up. I would not put that in a book. That's a horrible thing to put in a book. But they did. Um, and so, and the whole thing is basically, you know, someone, I think Merlin makes up this idea of the sword in the stone. You know, someone, one of the authors basically contributed the idea of a sword in the stone. And he got fed into it. And, um, and, and you know, and he pulls the sword from the stone. And everyone just goes, so? Like, no one cares that he pulls his sword from the stone. They're, all the other guys still want to be king. So he has to basically go and fight them and kill everyone. And then he becomes the king. So I kind of realized that the whole thing was basically the, the, the classic trajectory of The Godfather or Scarface or any other of those classic gangster movies. That, and that was the interesting thing. Is as well, it's, got the, it's got the rise, which is fun. And he's got the four, which is very quick. You know, we basically someone someone younger and hungrier comes along, Mordred, and kills him. And in the middle, there's there's nothing. There's no middle. So it's a book that has like a, a beginning, no middle, and a very short end. So it's really difficult to work with. And I think that's why people started coming in with this whole idea of the Holy Grail, which was invented by three different writers over the years. Um, and that's to give to give them something to do, because otherwise they're just 40 years of prosperity and then Arthur dies. So that was kind of the fun bit, was playing with the Grail. And also one of the original versions of the Grail is that it's a, it's a star stone. It's a stone that fell down from heaven. So, you know, I figured you could have, you could have that spaceship that shows up in, um, in Monty Python, in Life of Brian. I thought that would be funny. But, you know, they got away with it. I mean, you could put that in. Um, but it's because there's no real form of Arthurian fiction. It's just that everyone kind of goes, this is a really nice story. And I was working off a children's book, a Victorian children's book most of the time, just to kind of hit the plot points. And it's a horrible book for children. Absolutely terrible. But everyone is like, oh, it's, you know, it's a really lovely story about this guy who, you know, kills all his enemies and, and marries a, a wife who doesn't love him. And, Cheats on him with his best mate, and then his his son slash nephew kills him. 
<laughs> I mean, and then there's, there's stuff like Merlin. Sorry, I'm going on about it. I'll stop up this. But, but everyone thinks Merlin is this old dude with a bushy beard, right? That's kind of, that's the image that gave us Gandalf and uh, what's the dude from Harry Potter? Dumbledore. Oh, yeah, Dumbledore, yeah. But but in fact, he's uh, he's like a young, he's a changeling, essentially. He's like the son, like his father is some sort of um, fairy creature, or his mother is, you know, so he's half mortal. And the first time we see him, he's a kid, and he gets chased by the other kids in the village. And they're like, get away, you, you know, you, you monstrous creature. And he's a kid. So the first time Arthur runs into him, he says, you know, I'm Merlin the wizard. And Arthur kind of goes, no, you're not. Look at you. You haven't even got a beard. So Merlin literally goes away, changes into Gandalf, comes back, and Arthur's like, okay, yeah, you're a real, you're clearly a real wizard, not like that other guy who was here a minute ago. So I'm not making up very much. Um, I'm just kind of stripping away the pretense around it, but still trying to make it really fun, you know. It's a horrible story about horrible people, but that's kind of fun to fun to write. I hope it's fun to read. Well, one of the other questions I'm seeing here is, could you both describe how your writing process goes a little bit? So I think you are kind of getting into that now that you were talking, like how, how your writing process, is it very organized or are you, are you picking and pecking at things that come at you? I, I have it down to like a fine art, which is basically in order to write, I have to watch six hours of television. <laughs> which is from about 10 o'clock at night <laughs> to about one o'clock in the morning. And then I write between one and two. <laughs> That's it. It's terrible. It's, I have to like, I have to numb myself into this kind of zone of complete boredom. And then I just, I write it. Now I write all the time and I, and I like you, you know, I write fast and fairly clean. Um, what I found with my force alone was I finally realized I'm not really a novelist, you know, I find like big chunks of novels really difficult. And how do you do 125,000 words of story when you're a short story writer, essentially? And I realized I'm much better at these sort of episodes, you know, these chunks. So I could almost plot them to be their own, to be their own story, you know, with a beginning, a middle and end three things to happen, etc., And then I would finish it and I'd be like, well, what happens now? I have no idea. I have to like do the research a bit. I have to think about it and work it out. And so I'd have like two, three weeks in between where I'm like, oh, this is so annoying. I'm not doing anything. I'm just watching TV or whatever. Um, and then eventually it would come together and I'd write the next section. So that's how I did the Robin Hood book as well now. Um, and that's probably how I'm gonna do Shakespeare and the rest of them. So it seems to work for me. But that's only because I, I, I have no idea how to write novels. I mean, I wish you could tell me how to actually write a novel. Well, one of the other questions was actually about like uh, writing standalones. They say, I'd love to hear your reasoning for writing standalones. Have either one of you ever had an interest in writing novel series? So the answer for me is no. And I guess the answer for you is also in that arena. <laughs> Well, what happened to me was what happened to like nearly every sci-fi fantasy novelist at some point is you sell a book, which in my case was a book called The Bookman, um, and you intended to be absolutely a standalone book. And the publishers say, you know, that sounds great, but what if it was three books? <laughs> so you write two more books that you'd never planned to write and no one actually wants to buy. Um, and, and then somehow I ended up writing a thousand pages about giant lizards from outer space in uh, Victorian England. And you kind of think, what, why, <laughs> why did I do that? Um, so, and then of course now I'm kind of talking about writing half a million words of a sequence. But the idea is that each book, and, and I did that with the other one, I can't do series at all because I get bored, but if I can write each book to be standalone, and then if you have some some things repeating and you have kind of a sense of continuity, that's fine. But I wish I could. I wish I could write, um, you know, Philip Marlowe. I could have, or James Bond, or, you know, 
or or Jack Reach. You know, I tried, I tried to do it. I wrote six chapters of a thriller once. Six <laughs> chapters. I nearly died of boredom. So but it wasn't it wasn't good. It wasn't good. I, I also get bored, which is the answer about why I only write standalones. But uh, here's a question that's kind of semi-related semi because you and I talk a lot about Pulp Fiction. So hmm. it is, um, what are some of the authors, genre or non-genre, who have inspired your writing? Well, I'll ask you that question. <laughs> uh, well, I, um, I I started reading um, what we call weird fiction when I was a teenager, right? So I, I read Edgar Allan Poe and then I discovered Lovecraft and Lovecraft was kind of like a gateway drug into all the pulp of the 1930s. Um, and then uh, through him, I read uh, some other horror people and then my mother and father, my mother especially, my mother was a big horror fan. So she had Stephen King and Ghost Stories Drop and all those kinds of books. And my father, what he had was Lord of the Rings and Dune. You know, Dune was quite popular. Uh, I guess, you know, you smoked weed and you read Dune and, and that kind of stuff. So he had the Dune books, right? Uh, so I read those through him. So I got a really good kind of like classic kind of sci-fi education. But then, you know, in school in Mexico, I was exposed to all of the Latin American literary greats. So, you know, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, uh, Rulfo, um, everybody. Um, and I found other people on my own who were kind of not part of that canon uh, and were part of the emerging um, crime wave in, in Mexico, the novela negra, then kind of like the neo noir. And that's where I met some. Other folks like Facinacio uh, Tebo Segundo, and my mother also write write reading those. And then I went back and I read all the American classics. So that's where I read, um, you know, Marlowe, where I read Jim Thompson, where I read all those guys. And and it was a lot of men. There were also some some women, but you know, a lot of men. That's where I found the talented Mr. Ripley, um, and all that kind of stuff. And so I got a really good, I think, broad education and so i i love kind of like everybody i love so many you know different writers uh, there's there's a lot of writers that are forgotten now it's it's so weird how quickly writers can be forgotten so you go to dime stores and you find you know somebody who wrote 30 books over a span of 30 years and was quite well known and you know mystery author pulp fiction and then they disappear from the from the current kind of conscience but but there's so much stuff that is just weird and interesting and uh, and you love old bookstores uh, i know i know you do so it's it's just sometimes funny what you can find lying there and you can be like oh uh who the hell is is this guy and and so i i like going down rabbit holes of of information and sometimes if i like one one thing that somebody looked looking for everything else that I can find about them. So I gorge sometimes. If I find one book, then I'm like, I read like five or six. And it's very easy with Pulp Fiction because they were thin. Oh man, I miss that. I do miss that about books. Mm. What do you mean? You know, also in sci-fi and science fiction, um, the first book of Amber by Selassie is less than 50,000 words. I, I was looking at that the other day, Nine Princes in Amber. It's a great book. I read those when I was a teenager over a weekend. I didn't sleep. Because there was five of them, so he yeah, was like one, two, three, four, five. But they're only fifty thousand. Uh, I think the postman rings twice is about forty thousand uh, words, and so they're very easy to consume. So I love that kind of stuff, and that and that's the kind of stuff that really inspires me, and and that I and that I really love is kind of like the obscure, um, the strange, and the things that stand out because they don't make sense within the genealogy of a writer. When you find this one book that is just completely different from everything they, they did, ah, that is, that is just so good. Then you're like wondering, why did they write this one? Um, in the case of Patricia Highsmith, that is The Price of Salt, which was made into a movie called Carol, where she wrote a lesbian romance mm. drama. Yeah, but everything else she writes is like crime books about horror people. And here you have this romance, which has a happy ending. It's just so unlike 
Patricia Highsmith, and that's the kind of stuff that I'm always very curious about. People who suddenly write a children's book, like you did, you know, and and the rest of their stuff is not children's books. You're like, what is this thing doing? <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> Uh, now, I mean, I, I, one thing I noticed that um, you got, you kind of brought up, and I find that very often, is people miss the references you put in because they're not familiar with the culture. Mm -hmm. um, I, I had, I saw an academic call for paper that said we, you know, we want to talk about post-colonial writers, but we also want to talk about, you know, Anglo writers like Levite Dar, and I was like, <laughs> when, when did they become an Anglo writer? And I kind of. I said to the guy, like, okay, you know, I was bored, but, um, and he said, oh, I guess I, I, I think of you as an Anglo writer because all your books are so kind of <laughs> Anglo. I don't know. I'm like, that's because you don't recognize any of the, the references because exactly. you're not familiar with Hebrew literature because no one is familiar with, with Hebrew literature, to be fair, you know. Um, and I think for, for Hebrew writers, there's the thing that you always go back to the Bible. You always go back to the Hebrew Bible. No one, you know, you can't get away from it, so so everything kind of gets worked into that. Um, but you know, but it is super obscure. And you write about secondhand bookshops because now you can't find Amazon and places like that are almost impossible to find things randomly. You know, it's all about algorithms trying to tell you that if you like this, you would like this. But it's not the way it actually works. I won't like this just because I like that. Um, and I remember, you know, one of the most of the discoveries I've made were just randomly browsing in second-hand bookshops and looking at old books that, that kind of have been passed around quite a lot. And if I'm lucky, I'll find, you know, maybe one writer a year or every two years that kind of changes the way I look at things. Um, in fact, one of them was my friend uh, Shimon Ada. We published a couple of times as well. And I think his books are actually finally coming out in English translation at some point in the future, post-pandemic. And, you know, I read his book over, like, in one night, and it just completely blew me away because I've never seen anyone do what he did. And he kind of, you know, he comes from this great love of science fiction and crime and, and genre, but he's a very literary author and, and, and an award-winning poet and so on. And he kind of just combined them all in a way that I haven't seen done. So I tried to copy that, you know. Um, in a bad way, and I think that's the that's what happens when you find a writer that really influences you. You try and you take something new on board and and try and use it. So I think you know I found the Spanish crime writers like a huge influence, um, like uh, Montalban, who wrote you know the the Buenos Aires Quintet, and uh, the detective Montalbano is named after him. Uh, for example, so I came across him fairly randomly, or or Taibo, who I think we we both read. You know, I, I found him in a secondhand bookshop in Laos, and I was just like, I was blown away because what he did, he basically killed his protagonist in the last book, like he filled him full of bullets, right? He was dead, and then he thought, well, I'll bring him back. I want to write another book with this guy, so I'll just bring him back. So he walks around. He's essentially a corpse at that point, but he's just walking around solving another crime. And and I love the the kind of the Spanish attitude to crime is not to say this is about the crime, this isn't about solving the mystery. It's about the politics and the culture. You know, it's about fascism. They're, they're very interested in fascism because obviously they all kind of had to live under it for a long time. And that completely changed the way because the way I looked at stuff. Because I said you can use crime as a literary device, you know. Even though saying that, what I'm doing at the moment, I'm sure I told you, is I'm writing these vampire mysteries for Tor. Um, and there's yeah. nothing pretentious about that. It, it's just plotting golden age mysteries involving vampires, which is incredibly hard to do. Incredibly hard. Um, so, yeah. 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 But, uh, yeah, I do agree. It is. It, it is a problem. Um, for example, a lot of people said, is Mexican Gothic inspired by Guillermo del Toro? And no, it's inspired by many things, but one of them is a Mexican director from the 1960s and 70s called Carlos Enrique Tabuada. I named my character after him. And so that's who I'm referencing, but nobody understands the reference. Um, and when it comes to crime, I've also had that problem with where Anglo editors are like, well, this is not really crime. It's not a, really a thriller. It's too boring. 
Um, and, and again, I'm referencing, especially in what, the one that's going to come out next year, I'm referencing like, you know, the, the noir of Latin America. And, and, and it has a lot of political stuff embedded into it. But you're right, people are not used to it. So they think, oh, this is wrong. Or they have only read one book. They've read 100 Years of Solitude. And so they're like, this book is not like 100 Years of Solitude. And you're like, of course not. Because that's like if you judged American fiction, every book by the great Gatsby, it would be horrifying, right? Like that's, that would be the only book that book. exists. It's a good book. But if it was the it's only book, book that existed, you know, it would be... So sad, but that's the kind of situation that I think we're all in as as writers who come from a different kind of tradition. Uh, but somebody's asking about a no the novella making a comeback. Are your vampire stories novellas or are they short stories? What are they? They are just under novellas. No, they're, they're getting more complicated, but I think if you're gonna do a classical murder mystery, even if it's highly, highly tongue in cheek, um, it's still very much that Sherlock Holmes size story so i've been resisting a novella even though Tor really wanted me to do one um and at the moment they seem happy to basically publish them if i write them so there's like three of them coming coming out over the next well i think the first one is coming out in november on tor.com and then so um <laughs> so i'm trying to plot another one but it's so hard um and it really makes me think about plotting it really makes me think especially how murder mysteries are constructed that you have to have your victim, you need to have your murderer, you need to have your suspect, you need to, it's really hard. Like, and, and then throwing vampires into the mix. And one of the fun jokes in it is at some point, um, the detective's assistant, he says, he says, you know, clearly the solution is that they were all on it together. And they got <laughs> together to kill this guy. And, and the detective goes, well, that would work if it was people, but vampires, they don't work <laughs> together. <laughs> you know, it's not murder on the Orient Express. Um, so you have to figure out that they're not that smart, which I think is, is more of a, a noir thing than a golden age thing, but uh, that gets very technical. I, I would say that, just to anyone who's still listening, that I would highly recommend Untamed Shore. Is it Untamed Shore or Untamed Shores? I'm Untamed Shore, singular, Un yeah. Untamed Shores. Which I have in first edition, which I will, um, I will sell to the highest bidder. But it's very, very good uh, noir novel. So. Oh, um, somebody's asking, Levi, what are you drinking in your picture from Twitter? Let's say water. <laughs> Let's say water, not gin. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, we have some more questions. Uh, has 2020 changed the trajectory of your fiction or how you two are writing your column? So I think we talked a little bit about that, but in terms of our column, we did do several unplanned pandemic related columns. Uh, some of them were about how to relax, <laughs> like relaxing reads during the pandemic. And we had that pandemic uh, uh, column. Well, you know, it's it's been a little bit of um, we've done some escapism reading. So, yeah, we we had a kind of like a different thing planned for this year. Well, but, right. What happened was that we had everything planned and then the pandemic happened. And then the Washington Post said, can you do pandemics? Yes. Um, and we had to and uh, we were like, we're not really that, you know, pandemic books are very boring. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right. They're just very boring and you don't want to read them. And as soon as we did that, we got so depressed. We said, let's do like escapism. Yes. Um, so they love that. And I think now they're letting us sort of go back to like, what other columns are we doing? We're doing, well, we're doing Spanish, um, SFF. Or, and then we're doing, in October, we haven't decided if we're doing vampires or haunted houses. We're having a fight about yeah, it. Yeah, maybe you guys could weigh in. I'm, I'm saying vampires, because it's easy. I'm saying haunted so houses. Yeah, 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 for I'm, I'm not, I'm not a horror guy, so it's, it's harder for me. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah, okay. Let's look at the other let's, question. Um, we, yeah, let's check the questions. Haunted uh, houses. Haunted houses. Uh, well, we got one for vampires. Vampires in a haunted house. Yay. <laughs> uh, well, you've, done, you've done a very good vampire novel as well, which I would have loved to see as a TV show as well. Um, 
which is certain oh, yeah. dark thing. Yeah. Uh, but I think that's coming back next year. It's coming back with Tor and Nightfire. Yeah, back into print. The book that almost killed my career, rising from the grave. <laughs> <laughs> Which again was funny because we were in the same in the same boat again. We we were with the same publisher, and at the time when they kind of just lost interest in publishing, <laughs> <as far laughs> I could I could make out. They were like, ah, yeah, and, they uh, don't. It, yeah. it was, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, One of going back to traumatic from, experiences of my life, but yeah. <laughs> going back to what you said earlier, it's you know about thinking this is the end. You know, it's been a good run. That's literally what I think with every book. I think this is the last one. They're never going to let me do this again. You know, I'm <laughs> never going to get away with it again. Or, you know, the publisher is going to collapse or collapse. all the bad things that can happen tend to happen. Um, and one of the amazing things is that we're still here. Somehow. Uh, it's about longevity. Yeah. Somebody's asking about a Spotify playlist that I created for Mexican Gothic. Do you create playlists to set the mood for your writing? I am obsessive compulsive, so I actually just listen to the same record uh, over and over again while I'm writing. And if I don't have my headphones on, that's when they come to yell at me, like, you've been playing the White Album of the Beatles for, you know, 30 times <laughs> in a row. Could you put something else? But it's it's more like that than a concerned effort. Um, so I don't know about you, Libby. If you listen to music when you're uh, when you're writing, I I have this thing. Um, at some point, it's the low points of every novel. Um, I grew up on you know with the MTV stuff, <laughs> all those weird music videos from the nineties that the, that MTV put out. And I was trying to explain to a friend of mine who missed that whole period, and I'm like, dude. It's it was weird, <laughs> and it, there's some low point of writing a book. I will end up on '90s MTV music videos and YouTube on kind of a repeat thing. For and I, and I know this is kind of the point where you know you have the, the the only way is up from here. This is kind of the low, the, the bottom of the the whole process. Um, so no, I don't. I mean, I had publicists ask me to do playlists a couple of times and. I'm, I'm, everyone I think agrees that I have a terrible taste in music, so I'm not the, the right person to ask. Not the right. Um, here's another one. Do you have actors you have fan casted as your characters? That is a question for both of you. Um, I have to be honest and say that because my characters are of a certain ethnicity, there's almost like no actors that I can fan cast because there's not very many Latino actors out there with a big profile for most things. Um, for Mexican Gothic, because there's a bunch of white people in it, I thought that Charles Dance uh, or somebody like Julian Sands could be great as a like patriarchal villain, but that doesn't always happen with my books. I don't know about you, Levy. The only, um, it's, not, it's not something I think about. The only one I did was, I'd love, you know, I, my, my Adolf Hitler book, <laughs> back to it. you know, yeah. A Man Lies Dreaming, which is also hopefully getting reprinted next year. So I'm trying to kind of save this book. No, it turns out no one wanted to read the book about Adolf Hitler as a private detective. I mean, who knew? Well, um, that's, your, oh, that's a great book. <laughs> but but the whole point of the book. Well, which is, of which is perverse to say, but it is so funny at the same time. It's very cathartic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of exclamation marks at the end. Um, <laughs> but the whole point is that he's basically an Adolf Hitler who never came to power, so he doesn't have a moustache. And um, and the whole thing is, I, I worked with a comics artist once, and he said, "Look, there's no way to draw. The only way to draw Adolf Hitler without a moustache." is to draw him with it and then take it off. So I've been kind of racking my brain as is who could play an unsuccessful Adam Hitler, you know, in his fifties. And I've been kind of kind of running, you know, running through my mind who could do that. But since no one is ever going to make this for TV, I think it's a, it's a, it's a it's a futile endeavor. All right, let me see if we can run through the last few questions. Uh, okay, these are both for me. I'll try to run through them really quick. 
how did you document all the folklore and Mexican symbols? Um, in general, for all of my books, you mean? I mean, like, I'm Mexican, so this is just, like, built into my bloodstream. <laughs> um, and my great-grandmother used to tell me a lot of folklore stories. So, honestly, it's probably oral tradition rather than anything that has been written down. Although I do go look at anthropological and folkloric studies done about certain things just to see what, what they have. But I always kind of default in certain things to what my great grandmother told me. Cause I think she was right about a lot of stuff and a lot of um, historical details that she narrated and she couldn't read or write. So it's all kind of like oral tradition. Um, but I do go and check sometimes like you know, like what do folklorists say about this specific thing? And and sometimes there's no agreement because precisely it's oral and so it's transmitted, it changes. And so you just, you know, look at it and you then make, make a choice about what you're gonna use. Uh, then there's another one in Mexican Gothic. How do you use the opening chapters in Mexico City to establish ideas of race and class that you develop in the novel? It's so interesting how you play with these tropes as the narrative uh, progresses. So it's only one chapter in Mexico City. So we go very quickly from Mexico City to Hidalgo. And I know people sometimes say, your book is slow. It, like, it takes time to get to the haunted house. And I'm like, the haunted house is in chapter two. I couldn't get there any faster. But that is the truth. I couldn't get there any faster. Um, I thought I needed an establishing chapter outside of that place because I wanted to to show what the 1950s would have been in this kind of high class milieu. Uh, but then we go immediately to like the, to Hidalgo, to the countryside and, and we see what it's there. I wanted the first chapter to be in Mexico City and in like a party and with everybody having a good time because the image that most people have about Mexico is that it's a desert, like in Speedy Gonzalez, everybody wears big hats and everybody's poor and they eat dirt, you know? And so, I mean, looking back at my family, I have two sides, one side that was very poor and the other side that was very well off. And the side that was very well off, I mean, uh, they sometimes went, went shopping to the States, you know? And they do like, you know, it's, it's like a, not everybody is, um, yeah, eating stones for breakfast in a country. There's always a high class, a middle class, a low class. There's differences geographically. So that just, I thought, allowed me to show a little bit of that. Um, so, yeah, I think we are at an end. If nobody has another question. Oh, let me see the comments on the side. Why fungi for the Mexican Gothic? Yeah. Did your grandma tell you stories about them? No, I just really love mushrooms. I'm, I'm actually a mushroom fan. When, when there's mushroom festivals, I go and I look at them. Um, but also uh, mushrooms are used for religious rituals in a certain culture, in indigenous culture in Mexico. So the famous hallucinogenic mushrooms that, you know, people taking shrooms to experience visions come from religious rituals in um, in, in central Mexico. So they're used for something else. I also read a book about, um, it's this very weird book about mushrooms and connections to, I think it was to the Holy Grail, um, if I'm not mistaken. It was a very odd book. And, and I read a lot about mycology and uh, the properties of certain of certain substances. Uh, just fungi are a very interesting organism. They're not a plant and they're not, an animal and they actually talk to each other through a network underground, the Nicorosale network. <laughs> yeah. So they can send information through a forest. They're, they're a very important part of a forest. People always think about the forest as a thing, you know, like um, like the trees above or the mushrooms below are a very important part of biodiversity. And also the mushroom that you actually see above, that's just the fruiting body. The real mushroom is all underground. So like that idea of things that are hidden, right? Like you, you're walking over something. The reason why they pop up after it rains is because they're already there. It's not that they grow overnight. They're all already there. So if you want to be, it, it sounds scary, but it also sounds really kind of interesting to me, an organism um, that is able to kind of like 
just wait its time, right? And then just go like, here I am, ready to reproduce. Um, yeah, but they can be scary yeah. too. <laughs> You're a bad influence. I think I've even been taking pictures of mushrooms for you every time I see one growing. Um, I know, but they're so fed... different. Yeah, no, I, I, I keep meaning to send them, but I, I turned out to just take them. But um, they, they fed into my Robin Hood book, in quite, and they're actually in by force alone as well, because the Romans like got high on some sort of infected rye thing. And, and basically, it turns out everyone was high on mushrooms all the time um so you know but i think you just you're just a mushroom nerd i am a mushroom nerd yeah i think it comes from love yeah it comes from it comes from love not um not hate (laughs) and i guess (laughs) and i guess it's the same with anything in science fiction and fantasy even though we make uh fun of certain you know writers and tropes and whatever ultimately it comes from a deep place of love even th white and the sword in the stone. <laughs> yes, on that note. Yes. That note. <laughs> Although you could mention your fungi anthology that uh, came out a few years ago. Oh, that's right, you're in it. Yeah. So, you know, if, you, if you're looking for a lot of stories about mushrooms, that's the book. That's that the, is the book. And it was only the book. Perfect. <laughs> All right. All right. So, yeah, I guess we can well, say goodbye. Yeah, thanks everyone for coming, uh, listening to us talking rubbish right now. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll meet up in the less depressing circumstances. Very much. Thank you very much. I guess we can say goodbye. All right.